the recent release of the Lance Armstrong 30 for 30 on ESPN um, documentary looking at all of the doping that went on, not only in his career, but in cycling in general. Um, I wanted to put together a video about the sports science behind EPO use or synthetic EPO use and blood doping, which are the two main methods that those cyclists were using to be able to have a performance advantage um, or that competitive edge uh, at the time. And it's what's sometimes still used today. So we're going to break down how that uh, how that actually works, the science behind it in a very, very simple way, because I think it's really important to understand what we're actually talking about when these terms are thrown around. So when you're watching um, a documentary series like this, or if you've seen Icarus on Netflix as well, um, any of those series that have gone into the background of doping and particularly in endurance sport, um, it can be a little bit hard to follow along if you don't understand what they're actually talking about when they throw out some of these complex terms. So today we're gonna break it down nice and simple. Um, let's get into it. Hey guys, Nick here. Welcome back to the channel. We're talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Thanks to everyone who's already subscribed already, but if you haven't or you're new to the channel, please hit the subscribe button down below uh, to keep up to date with all the new videos that are coming soon. Um, we've already got some great videos on there and I've been really impressed with some of the feedback so far. So looking forward to making more content, but really appreciate if you hit that subscribe button uh, to follow along. What we're talking about today uh, really stems from myself watching the Lance Armstrong 30 for 30 documentary on ESPN uh, that was re released over the last couple of weeks. and. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the doping that was going on and the types of methods and the, the use of EPO, etc., and what it was actually doing from a sports science or a sports performance enhancement aspect, why it is then illegal and, and, and that side of things, because I think it's a really critical part of the equation. When, when you're watching shows, like I mentioned in the intro, when you're watching shows like Icarus or you're watching this 30 for 30 on Lance, you need to have a bit of an understanding appreciation for why it was sort of why it was wrong and why these doping protocols are in place to stop behavior like this because it completely changes how an athlete can perform in a sport and it, and it completely just opens opens everything up to to not an endurance winner or an endurance sport winner that has basically outperformed everyone because their physiology is is being tuned and, and they've trained and they've done the hard work it's basically we're just we're just taking this supplement or or a substance or using a particular method um, that is just getting the shortcut to the to the top and if i want to i'm going to use an analogy it's like when they climb up to where's in the tour de france it's like one bloke just riding the chairlift to the top and then he just rides back down the other side but everyone else had to ride the entire climb that's kind of what we're looking at when we talk about someone who's doping and and on a re doping regime a big performance enhancement versus those who are doing it clean and natural. So I want to break down the science. First of all, though, my opinions on the 30 for 30, if you've followed along the Lance Armstrong story over the last decade, 15 years, however long this has been going on, because it seems like it just goes on and on and on, um, even though we've come to an end, it's still relevant uh, today. And I think it will be for a long time. But if you followed along, you probably will watch the 30 for 30 and go, I've already seen this. I already know about this. And there's not a massive amount of new information from a Lance Armstrong and a doping perspective and what was happening. I think the really interesting parts of the documentary are about those who did dope, who got caught, and then the ramifications of that on some of them. Others had different treatment. And the prime examples uh, are guys like, um, obviously Lance Armstrong was gonna cop it pretty bad and, and he was sort of the prime suspect or the, the key um, the key kingpin, if you like, in the whole, the whole doping scenario if you can get him then then the whole sport hopefully gets cleaned up but you have a look at guys like him Jan Ulrich a few of the other riders who who doped and really got hit with harsh penalties but then you, you have a look at some of the riders like George Hincapi, Floyd Landis, Tyler Hamilton all these guys who were also part of these doping regimes who saw, because they sort of jumped on it early and realized that the ship was sinking um, it, it's the type of thing that they've been able to work back into media roles and and sort of looked at as i guess george hincapi in particular particular a bit of a hero of the sport um rather rather than well hang on he was also doping as well so that i think that part was really interesting and in looking at some of the the psychology of some of the others that we haven't really heard from a lot i know floyd landis was um it was mentioned it was shown quite a bit and that's that's something that i hadn't personally seen a little bit previously so i'd love to hear your thoughts if you have gone and watched that 30 for 30 um it is quite long it's a couple of hours worth um i think it's like an hour and a half per episode it's 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 a lot but if you can go through and watch it, i'd love to hear your comments down below what did you think of it did you learn anything new was there anything the same um, is there anything you want to talk about let me know down in the comments below and, and happy to have that chat because it's I find I find the whole scenario and the story really captivating and I'm sure most of you do as well. 
Coming to the point of this video though, is what is actually happening from a doping perspective? And there's two, there's two really main things that all those cyclists were doing in terms of doping to get a performance edge um, or enhance their performance illegally. And the, the two that I'm talking about are synthetic EPO or the, the use of injectable synthetic EPO. And then also moving on to blood doping, which involves trans, transfusions um, and, and more of a method rather than a substance. Synthetic EPO, that's, that was the, the original, I guess, golden substance um, that athletes were using to enhance performance. And the reason why it works is because all, all we're taking is a, a, a generated in a lab version of a naturally occurring hormone. And what I mean by that is that it's a it's a replication of what we already have internally within us. So EPO is actually naturally occurring by itself within the body. And its main role is to stimulate the production of red blood cells. Red blood cells at the end of the day are what carry the oxygen around the body. And so if we have more red blood cells, we get better oxygen transport through the system, which then is gonna allow us to use more oxygen at the working muscles or have more oxygen available to be used at the working muscles. The delivery system and the transport system around, around the body is far more effective and useful. We get this stimulation of EPO naturally, so without doing any sort of doping, we get this natural stimulation of EPO by going to altitude. And that's why altitude training is, is really effective. I'm not gonna to talk too much about it today, but essentially when you go up to altitude and high enough altitude, 2,000, 2,500 meters, you have exposure that lasts typically for about two weeks um, of continuous exposure. Quite often you're either living up at altitude um, or and, and doing like a training camp for a couple of weeks or you're living in an altitude house or a tent um, at sea level so you can still go and train. Again, I don't wanna to get too much into the altitude protocols because we're more on talking about doping today, but really the benefits of altitude training are we're gonna stimulate this production of red blood cells through naturally occurring EPO. And that's why it's so effective in elite performance. You hear about a lot of elite athletes going and doing these altitude camps and, and why even in cycling, the Colombian cyclists are really, really good. Um, like Nara Quintana, for example, is, is a really solid climber, usually up in the up in the hills because he was born at 3,000 3, meters of altitude. Um, amazing red blood cell count as a result of that consistent um, exposure to altitude, which is gonna stimulate EPO, et cetera. When we come back down to sea level and we've had that stimulation of EPO, we generate more red blood cells for a limited time when we come down to sea level, so it doesn't last forever, but for a limited time, uh, we have this boosted boosted level. So we're able to train harder, race harder and faster purely because we get better oxygen transfer through, through the bloodstream and to where it needs to go. What injecting synthetic EPO does is replicate that process, but we don't have to go to altitude and it happens basically overnight. So in a lab, they, they, they create the same um, product, if you like, and using the same genetic material, synthetically develop EPO, put it into an injectable, um, injectable fluid, bang, straight into the system. It basically tricks the body into that altitude um, effect. That's how we're getting improved performance. So it was a really quick and easy method, and this is why um, athletes like Armstrong, Jan Ulrich, those cyclists were using it is because at the time they couldn't test and detect synthetic EPO because the tests only available would pick up EPO but they couldn't distinguish between what was naturally occurring and what was synthetic. So they could always just argue it as, well, I just went up to an altitude camp, I've been at altitude riding in the French Alps or in the Pyrenees, wherever, and that's that's why I've got more EPO in my system. You can't prove that otherwise. Move a couple of years down the track and water and you started and that started to get better and better at detecting this synthetic EPO. So now all these cyclists had to go, well, all right, if I use it, I'm going to get caught out how else can we get that same effect? And this is where blood doping comes in. And, and essentially what blood doping is, is is the process of taking out your pre-existing blood. So uh, as, it, as it sort of stood, they, they take out their blood during um, during training and, and racing, etc. take their blood out, they'd store it uh, for a period of time, allow their body to replenish. So when this ha this process happens when you go and give, a, a give blood, for example, or you have a blood test done, Blood's taken out of your body and the body just goes into a bit of a survival mode. It wants to replenish those red blood cells so it's going to stimulate naturally occurring EPO, um, stimulate red blood cells, more blood plasma, um, more white blood cells, more platelets, and really just recover and repair. It's like doing training essentially, but for your bloodstream, if that makes sense. When you do training, you damage the body and then it goes into a process of recovery and repair. Essentially, if we take out blood from our system, our body's going to replenish it and try to try to catch back up and get back to normal. What these athletes were doing though is they were storing the blood, allowing themselves to come back up to normal levels in terms of red blood cells, blood volume, etc. They would then take the blood that was stored 
spin it around a centrifuge. So what that does is spinning the blood really, really fast in, in test tubes separates all the components. So when you look at the test tube at, at the beginning, it's all mixed up, it's all over the place. You spin it around really, really fast for a period of time. And what we get is we get all the red blood cells, all the heavy stuff goes to the bottom, all the light stuff goes to the top. So then you can essentially filter the blood to get the components that you want. All the red blood cells at the bottom, the, the heaviest part, all the plasma is the lightest part. So like the watery fluid makes up most of the blood at the top. They strip out all the plasma, all the white blood cells, all the platelets, take all the red blood cells and just inject them straight back into their bodies. What this now does is now give you a high red blood cell count, but you haven't had to synthetically inject EPO. So staying ahead of the testing protocols, if they could test for synthetic EPO, that was great, but they couldn't distinguish when an athlete had an excessive number of red blood cells because they were just looking at, well, they're your red blood cells. It's the same genetic material. This is like, we can't make a distinguish, like we can't distinguish between what's, what's like real or what's not because it's all, real to some extent it's your own blood we can't we can't measure for that now modern day what they do is a biological passport on all of all athletes which means that they they understand a, a range of red blood cell count that is normal for you and natural for you and if you exceed that that's when there's a red red flag to identify all right something something else might be going on here other than just a significant training positive training effect um we might be looking at some sort of doping whether it be epo whether it be um whether it be blood transfusions or, or blood doping, there's something else going on. What we're essentially doing though, with either synthetic EPO injection or using blood doping and even the legal method, so using altitude training that is perfectly fine and perfectly safe to do as long as you're doing it appropriately. Um, what we're trying to improve in performance, like I said, is the transport of oxygen around the system, which is beneficial for both racing, training and performance, but also the recovery aspect. So you can get more oxygen through the system, it's better in terms of that repair and replenishment state, getting ready to go for the next day, clear out some metabolic byproducts, the, the fatigue and the leak from the day before, reduce some delayed onset muscle soreness, etc. But when we're actually racing and competing or, or training hard, uh, for example, and, and a great point in the 30 for 30 documentary is, is when they're talking about Lance Armstrong and a, and a um, team out at the time or a training partner at the time had to do an out and back time trial and he just kept going and going and going and then was basically like, well, why are we stopping? We finished our 10 minutes, sure, but I want to keep going. He just kept pushing harder and harder and harder. Why is that the case? Because an increased amount of red blood cells allows you to get the same amount of air in total, but out of that air, because there's more red blood cells, we can extract as much oxygen out of that air as possible, allowing us to deliver as much oxygen as we can to the working muscles, which then allows us to break down as much fuel as we can. So a combination of the doping and the training so obviously he was training quite hard but the doping allowed him to train at a higher level and compete at a higher level than what he would have otherwise i reckon if you go back and take out all the doping from the whole lance armstrong story and everyone was clean in a perfect world and perfect um ideal situation i still reckon he would have been a really successful cyclist because he had an incredible endurance um predisposition or, or genetics but what he did was he capitalized on that by using with some doping methods, EPO and uh, and the blood doping or blood transfusions process um, to be able to get the edge on everyone else who was doping. And that, that's where I guess the whole cycling thing is a bit um, a bit interesting because because everyone, overall, everyone was doping. So what he did was he became the best athlete he could from an endurance perspective and then doped on top of it, which put him up and above everyone else. Um, so if we had a level playing field where no one was doping, he probably still would have won. But would he have won seven Tour de France in a row? Probably not. You have a look at the best athletes now, and I know we're advanced in te technology and training methodology, sports science, etc. cetera, um, and everyone's sort of catching up in that regard. But you, you have a look at Team Ineos has won the last however many, or Team Sky, Ineos, the same thing. However many Tour de France races, Chris Froome could only win a certain number in a row. Um, you can only win, what, there was a two or three or, or so in a row, maybe four. Um, but winning seven clean is probably something that I would say is probably impossible to do. Um, it would take a, an exceptional athlete to be able to do it at that level for, for so long. Um, but in terms of doping, you can see how how far someone can take it. And it's almost kind of making a mockery at that point. You can look at it in hindsight and go, well, it's pretty bloody clear what he was doing. Um, but at the time, again, they couldn't test for things. They found it difficult. There was other stuff going on with corruption, things like that. But from a doping perspective, it makes such a big difference in performance when you can transport more oxygen around the system and there's more oxygen available to then use that give you a greater capacity to generate aerobic energy. And that's the key. It's if we can have a bigger aerobic engine, 
this is the goal of endurance training is try to develop how how well we can use the aerobic engine and how fast we can we can work or create energy using the aerobic system because it's non-fatiguing heat water carbon dioxide are byproducts of aerobic um, aerobic energy production heat as long as we sweat and cool ourselves down it's not going to fatigue us dehydration will fatigue us if we get too much heat and we can we overheat etc but heat by itself when you do a warm-up that's that's benefiting your performance muscle temp increasing muscle temperature as part of warm-up is a benefit come dioxide so as long as you're breathing and you're not holding your breath the entire time it's not going to fatigue you um, you just breathe back out exchange with oxygen and water you're just going to reuse in the body um, it's only when we start really tapping into those anaerobic systems when we when we need that additional energy to keep that wheel in front of us or um, to be able to attack and join the breakaway that's gone off up the road some of those moments are going to accumulate the more a higher amount of fatigue but if you've got a greater ability to use your aerobic system because you've got all this extra physiology working for you or you've unlocked this extra part of your physiology because of a doping method or a substance that's where it becomes an unfair advantage so hopefully that's given you a bit of an idea and a breakdown of the key methods that they were using and like i said i think it's just really important to understand what we're talking about when we talk about use of epo and blood doping so when you are watching documentaries like the 30 for 30 on lance or, or icarus or any of those that talk about sports performance and sports doping particularly in the endurance setting you have a better appreciation of what they're actually doing and you can sort of keep up with what the terminology is going on about um, other than that that's it for today and we'll see you in the next one